Okay, so let me just uh, give a couple of applications of this long division business. Okay, so this long division, often called the division algorithm, is a very important statement regarding polynomials. It has all kinds of very nice consequences. So, for example, if so, here's the first application of of the division algorithm. Let f of x be a polynomial uh, and let a be a root of f of x, let a be a root. A is a number, you, you, you could assume it is a real number or a complex number and so on according to the case, uh, a is a, a root of f of x then f of x can actually be written as x minus a times some other polynomial times q of x for some polynomial q. In other words, if f of a is 0, then f can always be written as x minus a times something, it is a multiple of x minus a. So, observe if f has this form, of course, if you substitute x equal to a, you will surely get a 0 because there is a term x minus a in front. Okay. The key content here is really the converse that if f of a is 0, then f must be a multiple of x minus a. And let us prove it just using the division algorithm. So, let us do the following, let us take, uh, so how do we prove this fact? So, let us just take uh, g of x to be x minus a and just apply the long division or the division algorithm. It says when you divide f by g, f of x can be written as g of x which is x minus a times a quotient plus a remainder. Okay, where what is the property of the remainder? the degree of the remainder so either where either the remainder is 0 or it is non zero and has degree it is non zero of okay with degree of the remainder being strictly smaller than the degree of the polynomial g now observe g is just a polynomial x minus a, so it has degree 1 because that is the highest power of x which appears, degree of g is 1. So of course this must be a 1. So what does that tell us about the degree of the remainder r? It can only be a 0 because the degree is strictly smaller than the degree of, of g, right. So there is only one possibility for the degree, the degree is always 0 or higher. So therefore we conclude that either r of x is 0 or r of x has degree 0. Now, what does a degree 0 polynomial look like? It is only got a constant term, right. Remember it looks like a0 plus a1, a1x plus a2x squared and so on, but if it has degree 0, it means it only has a constant term a0, okay. So, it is basically a constant. What we are concluding from here is that the remainder is a constant. It is either a 0 constant or possibly a non-zero constant. The claim is it's it's in fact a zero constant. It can't be a non-zero constant. Why? Because we have some fact about f. We know that if you plug in x equal to a, f becomes zero, right? So now observe that if I plug in x equal to a, the left-hand side is f of a, which is a zero. It's what's given about f. Whereas the right-hand side becomes the following: if I plug in x equal to a, of course this term becomes a zero. So it becomes zero times q of a which is a 0 plus r of a, well r is just you know it is 0 or a naught. So let me let me take the second case, I claim that this case cannot really appear, so plus this remainder a naught, okay. Now we just look at what both sides are, the left hand side is 0, the right hand side has a 0 in the first term plus an a naught, so a naught had better be a 0. So we conclude from here that a naught is actually a 0. So what does that mean? It says that the remainder cannot really be a non-zero constant. We, we conclude that the remainder is 0. So that tells you that f of x is just x minus a times q of x. You do not have any remainder term there. So that is exactly what we wanted to conclude.
okay so that's the that's the first application so we have just completed the proof of that the the second thing here says if f has degree d if f of x has degree d then it has at most d distinct roots then So, a polynomial of degree 10 for instance can have at most 10 different roots ok, it cannot have 11 or 12 or anything higher than 10. So, let us see why this must be true. So, let so here is a proof of this fact. So, let us write down all the roots. So, or you know let us say suppose we know some number of roots let x 1 x 2 till x l be roots of f. Let them all be distinct. So, I am looking at different numbers be distinct roots of f. So, now we use the first the, the first application where it said any time I have a root that polynomial if, if a is a root then x minus a divides the polynomial f. So, f can be written as x minus a times something ok. So, we just do the following we write f of x. So, since x 1 is a root we conclude f of x is divisible by x minus 1 x minus x 1 times q of x right. So, because x 1 is a root so let me write this down x 1 is a root of f of x implies f, f can be written in this way. So, that is what we just concluded. Now, let us plug in x 2 into this equation if you plug in x 2 for x then f of x 2 is 0 x 2 uh, on the right hand side you will get x 2 minus x 1 times q of x 2 and x 2 is not equal to x 1. So, observe so the second conclusion the following since x 2 is a root of f of x it actually implies that it must be a root of q of x as well x 2 is a root of q of x because x 2 minus x 1 the term in front is non 0 which means again you use the same thing it says since you know you have a root of q of x x minus x 2 divides q of x. So, let us call the quotient as something let us call it q 1 of x ok. Now, we what do we get putting these two things together f of x is x minus x 1 times q q is x minus x 2 times q 1. So, putting these together you conclude that f is actually x minus x 1 times x minus x 2 times this polynomial q 1 of x. Now, again the same thing I have a, a third root x 3 I plug in the third root here I get f of x 3 is 0 I plug it into the right hand side I get x 3 minus x 1 times x 3 minus x 2 both those are non 0 terms because x 3 is not equal to x 1 x 3 is not equal to x 2. So, these two are non 0. So, therefore, it must be q 1 of x 3 which is 0 ok. So, again we conclude the same thing. So, x 3 being a root of f. So, f of x 3 is 0 therefore, implies that this quotient q 1 must have x 3 as a root. So, again you do the same thing therefore, x minus x 3 must appear in q 1 you can write it as x minus x 3 times something let us call it q 2. Now, you keep proceeding at every step you conclude that a term of the form x minus x 3 will divide the next fellow x minus x 4 will divide the next fellow and so on. So, you keep going and conclude you know as at the very end of this process that so keep going finally, what do you conclude? Keep pulling out various factors like this all the way to x l times some you know some quotient let us call it uh, you know uh, let me call it g of x that is the final quotient the quotient I get the, at the last step. So, finally, this is my conclusion now observe that again it is the same degree argument on the left hand side f of x has degree. So, what is the degree of f of x? So, degree of f of x is d that was the assumption 
whereas the degree of the right hand side observe the right hand side has uh, well how many terms does it have there are L terms here and then one more which is you know another g of x the degree of the right hand side abbreviate to RHS is nothing but you know remember the property if you have a product the degree just adds up. So, I have each of these factors as degree 1. So, it will be 1 plus 1 plus 1 I have L such ones plus the degree of g. So, whatever this is this is at least L ok. So, the the uh, degree of the right hand side is at least L whereas, the degree of the left hand side is is exactly a d. So, what do you conclude from here? Hence, since the left hand side and the right hand side are both equal, you conclude that d must be d is the degree of the left hand side, and so that is at least L. Because the right hand side is the same as the left hand side, so degree of the RHS is the same as degree of the LHS, which is d, so d is at least L, that is the conclusion, ok, and that is exactly what we wanted to conclude. So, this was our claim that you can have at most L distinct roots ok. Ok, so this just one final thing before we, we end this, this uh, small lecture. Uh, this has one very nice consequence uh, a different way of, of rewriting the same thing. It says a polynomial of degree d is determined by its values at d plus 1 points. So, it is view it as another application of the same thing a polynomial of degree d is uniquely determined by its values at d plus 1 distinct points. So, it is like saying if I know that my polynomial has degree 3, then if I know the values of the polynomial at 4 points, any 4 points distinct points, then the polynomial is uniquely determined. You cannot have 2 different polynomials which have the same value at 4 points. Similarly, you know we, we already drew an example of a polynomial of degree 2. So, if we drew the graph of, of that polynomial, we saw it was a parabola. So, in general a, a quadratic polynomial will have a graph as a parabola. So, one, one instance of this is like saying uh, the parabola is uniquely determined if you just tell me what its values are at 3 given points. Okay. So, I, if I just tell you the value at this point, the value at this point and say the value at this point. So, through these 3 points here, so let us call them A, B and C, there is a unique parabola passing through the points A, B and C. So, sort of a one simpler version of this is if I have a polynomial of degree 1, its graph is a straight line ok and a straight line here according to this a polynomial of degree 1 is uniquely determined as soon as you tell me its values are 2 points. So, that is like saying there is a unique straight line which passes through any 2 given points ok. For a parabola you need 3 points that will determine the parabola. If you have a cubic curve, a curve of a degree 3 polynomial, if you give its values at 4 points it uniquely tells you what that curve is ok. So, this is something that we will start out looking at in the, the next module.